Deborah Holchip, editor of Michigan Today. In this episode of Listen in Michigan, my guest is Greg Stasko, a retired FBI agent and author who spent nearly 32 years working federal criminal cases in Detroit and Ann Arbor. Greg's career in law enforcement kicked off with a bang soon after he arrived in the Detroit field office in June 1975. Jimmy Hoffa, former president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, went missing that July. From there, Greg investigated and helped solve several of Michigan's highest profile cases, from serial murders in the Ann Arbor VA hospital that same summer, go 1975, to tracking down the Unabomber in 1995. He even discovered the identity of a major Michigan pot dealer named the Joker, who owned an ice cream shop on Main Street called the Love and Spoonful. Nice. Greg helped expose the Detroit branch of La Cosa Nostra and nabbed one of the most inept criminals ever, Mark Kornke, a white supremacist known as Mark from Michigan for his radio show, The Intelligence Report. After hearing friends and colleagues suggest that Greg write a book about his adventures in crime fighting, he finally did just that. FBI Case Files Michigan came out earlier this year and will intrigue people who recognize these thrilling and historic crimes and those who don't. If you're into true crime and favor tight, to-the-point storytelling, I can highly recommend Greg's book. I was a little surprised and frankly quite relieved that he hadn't yet heard of the podcast, My Favorite Murder. Here's Greg. I guess for the record, I I don't have any favorite murders, but as far as the fascination, I think it's human nature. As far back at least as Cain and Abel, uh, you know, as a kid, I was fascinated. I was thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing pretty good in law school. Maybe I should be a lawyer. And I talked to my folks and they said, now, you've always wanted to be an FBI agent. You need to do that. And if you don't like it, you can always get out and be an, an attorney. So that's what I did. And I never looked back. I loved it. I think about it all the time. And I still read especially stuff dealing with the Bureau and everything like that. For example, the insurrection on January 6th. They stormed the Capitol. I read all that stuff, and I'm I'm very, I'm very proud of what my successors have done in putting together those cases. And, you know, to get to Detroit and have Hoffa disappear, and then the Veterans Hospital case, and then a couple other kidnappings and stuff, I was thinking, wow, this is just like the movies. (laughs) But unlike what we see in the movies, Actual police work can be excruciatingly tedious. Take the serial murder case at the Ann Arbor VA hospital. Not exactly thrilling to investigate, but it did prove that Arthur Conan Doyle knew what he was talking about when he created Sherlock Holmes. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, is the truth. Nine patients at the Veterans Hospital died uh, during this period of time in 1975, there were over 50 questionable respiratory arrests. The indications were that Pavillon was the uh, was the culprit, which is the synthetic version of Terrari. Terrari is a plant-derived toxic. The South American natives used it on their blowguns. And ultimately, when uh, one of the anesthesiologists, Ann Hill, who was on, uh, Dr. Ann Hill was on the staff, Ultimately, she saw that the symptoms were from, uh, that she thought were from uh, Avalon, and immediately started to administer the antidote. And it worked. Uh, yeah. it, it immediately worked. Uh, they immediately recovered. So they knew that Avalon was the culprit. And that's when they realized that because Avalon wasn't even supposed to be administered to these patients, somebody was doing this illicitly, and we had a, we had a criminal situation. We think they were trying to demonstrate that the hospital was understaffed and they had serious problems. They weren't really trying to kill people, but some of the people, because they were so compromised, died, obviously. I also said that, you know, if we had had a motive, it would have made the case a lot easier to prosecute because, I mean, that's the first question everybody asks. Why did they do it? You know, they were part of this group that was very vocal about the understaffing at the hospital stuff. So that that is probably the motive, but we'll never know for sure. Probably my first week on the case, they sent about 20 of us out. And of course, I was a, a new agent. So they said, Greg, you're going to go down the basement and you're going to go through every employee's personnel file. If you wanted to make a movie that was uh, that strictly followed how the investigation went and everything, it would be pretty boring because 
Uh, I mean, there are aspects of it. And what you have to do is you have to distill it down into into a story to make it interesting. And, you know, you're covering, in some cases, covering months or even years of investigation, but distilling it into a story that, you know, is entertaining. Therein lies the challenge. I mean, true crime tends to be more interesting in the telling than in the actual crime solving. I mean, listen in as Greg explains how they identified Ted Kaczynski the Unabomber. I think most people now know that Ted is probably one of the less prestigious members of the Michigan Alumni Association. I don't know that he's a paying member, but <laughs> he um, uh, he went to Harvard undergrad. He was a math prodigy. Uh, Ted was socially inept, but a genius as far as math goes. Ultimately, he was admitted into the University of Michigan and received his uh, PhD in mathematics here, was hired as an assistant professor of mathematics at University of California, Berkeley, he was out there a couple of years. And then he resigned that position, even though he was on a tenure track, ultimately ended up going out in the woods, building a cabin and outside of Lincoln, Montana. He, he really just didn't like people. He really just didn't like anybody. That, I think, was as much as anything was the moving force in him. His way of coping with it was to send bombs to people, and they got progressively more powerful. My involvement in the case began when he sent a bomb in 1985 to James McConnell, who was a professor at Michigan, and he actually had written a number of books, not only textbooks, but the books that were popular in the late 50s, early 60s about behavioral modification. This was during the thing, you know, when stuff like the Manchurian Candidate was coming out, mind control. So Ted sent a bomb to him and it went off in McConnell's kitchen, severely injured McConnell's uh, research assistant. It also destroyed McConnell's kitchen. That bomb was not particularly well made. It was a pipe bomb but it ended up being a firebomb. But anyway, that continued on, I think it was 18 years. So the head of the task force out there and Louis Free, who was the director of the bureau at the time, and Janet Reno managed to persuade the New York Times and the Washington Post to go in together and publish the manifesto. Probably the only person in the world that could identify was his brother, David Kaczynski, and, and David's wife. She actually had had suspicions about Ted before, but after reading the manifesto, she and David came to the conclusion. And David had some old letters and things that Ted Kaczynski had written to him with things in there that were very, very similar to what was in the manifesto. So they redacted out all the personal stuff, or they tried to, out of these letters and gave them to an attorney. And it actually, the story gets a little convoluted, but it got to the task force and I got a call from the task force supervisor. Greg, we've been able to find a reference to the fact that whoever wrote this stuff went to Harvard undergrad, went to Michigan graduate school. We found one place where the name Ted, we think that's the first name, but we don't have a last. Can you contact the university and see if they had anybody like that? Yeah. I'm thinking to myself, I don't think so. That's just not enough information, but I hung up and I got to thinking about it and I thought, well, you know, if I go over to the registrar's office, they're not going to greet me with open arms. So I ended up calling a guy who was a friend of mine, Jim Smiley, who was the assistant director of the public uh, safety, the university police. I said, hey, I can't tell you what this is all about. I can't tell you it's important. To his credit, he didn't tell me I was nuts. Actually, within a few hours, uh, he got back to me. So I've got five names, but only one really fits everything. The dates are a little bit sketchy, but... And he said, it's uh, Theodore Kaczynski. And uh, again, I didn't tell him what it was about. I immediately called Joel Moss on the task force, explained to him what I had. And I remember Moss said to me, Greg, at this moment, you and I are the only two people in the world that know the Unabomber is Ted Kaczynski. Of course, it was like six weeks before we actually had arrested and searched Kaczynski's cabin in Montana. In the meantime, I couldn't tell anybody. In fact, I was told, do not tell anybody, not even your SAC, your boss. The rest is history, obviously. One key takeaway from this book, Greg knows how to keep a secret. As he points out, FBI agents need more than just crime fighting skills. Repeatedly throughout his career, he made and kept promises to key witnesses in critical investigations. 
part of being an agent, I, I think, is, you know, not only having an understanding of the law and the forensics and all the other stuff that you do, but it also has to do with, and a lot of it's, you know, the ability to interview and put these cases together and know what you need to put a case together. But you're, uh, it's psychology. You got to figure out a way to make them believe that it's in their best interest to confess and uh, to, to tell you the truth. That's not an easy sell sometimes. And with that in mind, get ready for another weird tale about identifying the Joker. It's a masterclass in patience and integrity. The Heilbrunn family was the largest marijuana uh, distribution ring ever prosecuted in the United States. And there were two brothers, the two Heilbrunn brothers, and then their mother uh, was involved. They were a Jewish family. She was active in the community. And I'm trying to remember the one Heilbrunn brother's uh, first name, but it doesn't make any difference. He was considered this great commodities trader. He actually wrote a column for the Indianapolis paper. But in the meantime, they had this huge marijuana distribution network. And one of their largest sub dealers was a guy that was within the organization. He was known as the Joker. And there were only one or two people that knew the Joker's true identity. So ultimately, when the case was prosecuted and all put together in this massive indictment, it was indicted with John Doe, a.k.a. the Joker, as one of the subjects. They didn't know who he was. They just knew he was up here in Michigan. And so I had a lead to try to identify him, and I did some investigation. And ultimately, I convinced a person that had been tangentially involved in the uh, Joker's distribution network. Uh, that person knew his identity I promised that person that uh, I would never identify them unless they wanted to be identified. And uh, to this day, they have it. But that person gave me the Joker's identity. And it was James Hill. I found a photograph, an old arrest photograph. And I sent it down to Indianapolis. And some of the subjects who didn't know the, uh, the Joker's true name were able to identify the photo. It, it was funny. When I arrested him, I walked up to take him into custody. And he got out of the car and he looked at me and he goes, Greg, how you doing? And I'm kind of looking at him with this puzzled look on my face. He says, don't you remember me? I played basketball with you at the Y a few times. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I guess I did know who he was, but I didn't know who he was. So anyway, that's how that turned. It kind of begs the question what was in the ice cream. So. <laughs> Some of Greg's stories are actually funny, even when they're about despicable white supremacists like Mark Cornkey. Mark was sort of a, uh, a humorous character. And that's, that's hard to say that when you talk about a guy that had a philosophy of white supremacy and things like that. But he was so inept, and some of his theories were so off the wall. But now you're seeing stuff like QAnon and stuff, and you're thinking he was um, uh, at least more believable than, you know, there are people out there that buy into this stuff. So This guy was one of the most inept losers the agent ever apprehended. The description of the bank robber was a guy wearing a baseball cap. So coincidentally, right at about the time of the bank robbery, Mark Hornkey had his two sons in the car. They were on uh, Main Street and Dexter. He was stopped at a light. He had his son jump out of the car and put a deposit in at the bank and then run back to the car before the light changed. And some bystanders saw this, him running from the bank and getting into the car and then the car leaving. It happened to be an old police car, actually, that he had bought surplus. Corky gets stopped right outside of town and he pulls over and the deputy starts to walk up to the car and Corky takes off. So they've got a high-speed chase going all around Washtenaw County, north of Dexter. And then he decides he's going to drive cross country off the road. And that usually doesn't work well, and I think he ended up hitting a tree stump or something. And then he got out of the car and started running, ultimately jumped into this pond, was swimming to the other side while the state police and the county depths walked around to the other side of the pond and waited for him, and he got out. They ultimately arrested him. In 1995, Greg was the case agent on a weirdly prescient landmark case in the early days of the Internet. This U of M student named Jake Baker, who lived in East Quad, was writing horrific and misogynistic murder fantasies online. He named a specific woman and her address and shared his fantasies in email. It's interesting because, you know, uh, and 
obviously uh, Judge Cohn threw it out be, uh, based on a First Amendment thing. And I, you know, I understand Judge Cohn's argument, but I also then, as I point out, now that you have these mass shootings and you've got people out there on social media talking about this stuff, well, the question then for law enforcement is, if you become aware of these communications, when can you intercede? Do you have to wait for them to do the mass shooting? If they're en route with guns, is that enough? In their communications, if they don't actually say a particular person or a particular place, does that mean that then you can't intercede, you need more? So these are all questions and it puts a tremendous burden on law enforcement. Then you get criticized because, well, why didn't you do something? Well, because they were exercising their First Amendment rights. In a lot of the cases, leading up to the insurrection. I think on social media, that was probably true. Ugh, it's so complicated. All right, well, let's switch it up. Let's say you had an FBI agent in your midst and one who worked on the Hoffa case. What's the first thing you'd want to know? Yeah, I think that they, uh, in effect, cremated him. They had access to a crematorium at a funeral home. They also had access to a commercial incinerator. And... Uh, I think, and, and, a, and a lot of the people that were involved early on believe that uh, they destroyed the body as quickly as possible. And that seems like the most uh, likely uh, way that they did it. Without a body, it would be uh, difficult, if almost impossible, to prove a murder, especially if nobody was willing to talk. And really nobody involved has really talked. And, you know, we, of course, we've got the the Irishman, Shaheen, Shireen rather, but especially the people that were involved in, and have been involved in the case don't believe that his story is true. We know why he was murdered and we know who was involved. The thing that they were trying to protect was the mob's relationship with the Teamsters Pension Fund and that ultimately ended because of it. So the very thing that they were trying to do really didn't work. Yeah, it's ironic that the Jimmy Hoffa's son is now running the Teamsters, and the Teamsters Pension Fund is no longer being used as a piggy bank for the, for the mafia. So. Sometimes you don't get all the clear answers, and other times you may have the answer. You just have to wait until everyone else catches up, like 19 years. Check out this story about one photo of Detroit crime family capos Vito Billy Jack Giacoloni and Anthony the Bull Corrado with crime boss Jack Tocco. Some of this stuff takes a long, long time. When we prosecuted the Detroit family of the La Cosa Nostra, the mafia, as I said, I took that photograph at the game farm of Jack Toco being made the uh, the godfather, the don of the family. Uh, that was in the summer of 1979. We didn't uh, we didn't go to trial, have the RICO trial until 1998. So uh, we're talking 19 years, and yet that picture was still relevant and was introduced into evidence. Two of the people in the photo were prosecuted in the RICO trial. Well, three, all three of them were. But Vito Giacalone, uh fortuitously pled guilty before the trial and admitted he was a member of the family. And nobody in, in that level had ever even admitted there was a family, let alone admitting they were a member of it. And then lo and behold, you got him in a picture standing next to Jack Toko. So that, you know, that made that picture that much more relevant. But how do you, how do you distill 20 years of investigation into a TV show or a movie for that matter? So. Yeah, you just cut out all the boring parts. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then you can, or you can do like they did with American Hustle, which was based on the ab scam. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do that and make it a very entertaining movie. But, but again, you're you're jumping over a lot of parts and making maybe making some of the characters a lot more sympathetic than they were. But yeah. That's, that's the way you make a movie, I guess. You don't generally talk about all the dead ends that, that are involved, but there are dead ends. It took a long time to convince that individual to tell me who the Joker was, but ultimately they did. And it was by developing uh, some rapport and trust with that person, and they ultimately did it. That's true in a lot of things. Rapport and trust. I like it. All right, well, I hope you guys had a great year and you have a happy holiday. Go out and buy your copy of FBI Case Files, Michigan. Imagine the true crime trivia you'll be able to share on New Year's Eve. All right, take it easy. Thanks for listening. And as always, go blue.